our baseline best case here is a shallow recession. And I think uh, the markets are starting to contemplate something more serious than even that. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Here at the midpoint of 2022, investors are assessing the terrible first half of the year and wondering what the second half will bring. And as we peer ahead right now, the storm clouds outnumber the sunbeams. Measured inflation remains hot and recession is on everyone's lips. It seems a foregone conclusion to many at this point. The Fed remains committed to raising the cost of capital and Q2 earnings calls are about to begin. Will companies announce downwards revisions to their forecasts, thereby sending stocks even lower? To address these important topics, we're fortunate to be joined by monetary expert and economic researcher Jeffrey Snyder, now of Eurodollar University and Atlas Financial. He's at the top of the list of experts the wealthy on audience has been asking me to bring on the program, and I'm thrilled he's finally been able to join us. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the program today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Adam. Thank you for the invitation. Been looking forward to it. Thanks. Same here. And like I said, we got a lot of people that have been excited to get you on the program here. So it's wonderful that we're, we're finally making it happen here. Um, all right. Well, Jeff, lots, lots and lots of questions for you, especially since I made the mistake of asking my audience in advance if they had any questions for you. And of course, I got buried <laughs> under an avalanche. Yeah, exactly. um, but let, let's start at a really high level one uh, just to kick things off here, which is what is your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, Adam, I think your introduction kind of spelled it all out. I don't know if there's, you know, is there any, any uh, room for interpretation here at this point? Uh, maybe earlier in the year, but I think uh, somewhere around March when gasoline prices spiked for that last time, we, we might have passed the point of no return. And so I think the reason why the public by and large has come, kind of come to terms with the fact that recession risks are high is because recession risks are high. And there's even a, a pretty sizable chance that a recession has already begun. Certainly some of the, of the uh, market chaos, market liquidations that are going on. Um, we've got labor market reports that are suggesting as much. So as far as an overview, uh, a good place to start. I mean, it's, and it's, not, you know, it's not just the U.S. either. The U.S. is certainly facing its own challenges, consumer prices here, recession risks here, but you see the same thing in Europe. You see the same things even in Japan, where inflation has never really been a problem for the last 30 years. All of a sudden, cost pressures all over the, the Japanese economy. China is China's very weak. Um, not, not a lot of good things out of China. It has, that has nothing to do with the lockdowns either, the underlying growth prospects for China. So I hate to be as, as sour and and as uh, doomish as that all is all that, but wherever you're looking, emerging markets everywhere, you know, you've got cost pressures that are leading to the classic supply shock case, which is usually resolved by, in this case, a global recession. So that's kind of what markets are pointing toward. And I think a lot of data is starting to move in that direction too. So as a general overview, recession seems to be the, the, uh, the big topic here. Okay, um, and I want to dig into the recession uh, topic with you a bit more, um, specifically sort of like how bad, how long, what it would look like relative to previous ones. But before we get there, um, let's talk a little bit kind of about how we got here, right? And so you talked about, um, you know, recession by definition is slowing economic growth, but you mentioned cost pressures several times. Um, anybody with eyes and with a, with a car and with a family to feed, you know, has definitely seen an increase in the cost of living over the past couple of years. Um, so a lot of people sort of lay the majority of that at the feet of the world's central banks. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. And, and, and as you sort of give us your thoughts, if you could just explain this statement that you, you've made in the past, which is QE and bank reserves aren't money. And you know, a lot of people think, OK, so the Fed, you know, increased its balance sheet from 800 billion to, you know, almost nine trillion dollars at this point. Um, that that's got to be hugely inflationary. Right. And I'm, I'm curious, given your statement, if you have a nuanced view of that. Yeah, th and that's really kind of the story of the last couple of years, as it has been the last 15 years, is what does the Fed actually do? Uh, you go back to 2009 when everybody said that the Fed's expanding its balance sheet, it's printing money, all these bank reserves it's creating out of thin air, that's going to be inflationary. 
We've heard that for over a decade that the Fed was going to, they were going to wreck the dollar, going to wreck the currency, and it never happened. The only thing that changed in 2021 was consumer prices finally showed up. But was that a case of the Fed printing too much money in concert with the federal government, then doing its helicopter payments and things like that? Did they finally go too far? Or is there something else going on here? And we'll get into the something else going on here part of it. It's the difference between inflation, genuine inflation, which is why I don't like using the term inflation for what's happened, because it has, this, what we're seeing uh, in the last couple of years isn't actually inflation. It's the, the uh, supply shock of, of essentially an inelastic supply situation, given a rightward shift in demand through some temporary uh, you know, stimulus uh, from the federal government and whatnot, which small e economics teaches us when you ever have inelastic supply and a rightward shift in demand, the only way to balance those out is by rising prices. And most people said, as you said, Adam, most people believe that, no, this is money printing. This is the Fed. It went crazy. In March of 2020 and April 2020, the Fed went with the, the biggest QE in history. It wasn't, but it, for the United States, it was the biggest QE in history, which, to which, who cares? Um, the entire history of quantitative easing is that there is absolutely no correlation between what the Fed does at buying assets and creating bank reserves and any result in the real economy. This goes back to the Bank of Japan and its first quantitative easing 20 years ago. I mean, the Bank of Japan's on QE 25 or 26 now, still hasn't gotten the results that it's sought after. I mean, you can even go back even further than that, go back to the Paul Volcker era. There is no correlation between bank reserves actual effective money supply and any outcomes in the real economy. And the reason is, what are bank reserves? Nobody ever stops and thinks about what these things actually are. You see the term base money thrown around casually because that's what everybody says. Um, and it's the Fed. The Fed, the Fed has a printing press. And if the Fed has a printing press, then aren't they printing bank reserves? And the answer is no. I mean, a bank reserve is nothing more than an interbank token that has special uses for the banking system itself. So the Fed can create all the bank reserves it wants unless banks actually do something with them. They, they mobilize them and use them in, in these special use cases. It does not matter how many reserves there are. Again, you can see this going back to Japan 20 years ago, even Paul Volcker in the 1979, 1980, 81 period. There's no correlation between bank reserves and any economic outcomes because the banking system is what matters, not the central banks. And there's a whole, you know, there's a whole explanation and a whole bunch of details behind that. But the, uh, the summary view is there is no correlation between bank reserves and economic outcomes because bank reserves are not money. They're limited use to interbank tokens that occasionally have some, uh, have some benefit for banks. And even, on, even when you're assessing quantitative easing on a very, you know, transaction level, it isn't, it isn't like the Fed is printing money and, and forcing it into the real economy. From the perspective of a commercial bank, quantitative easing is nothing more than an asset swap. You have a bond one day in your portfolio. You trade that for, to the Fed for bank reserves. And from the perspective of the commercial banking system, you've got one asset, you've got a different asset than you had the day before. It's not money printing. It's all this arcane accounting. Okay, so um, good explanation. I'm going to ask some basic questions, and then we're going to get to your okay. Well, then, what was the something that did happen that that created all this sort of you know higher prices that we're seeing here? Um, so uh, I'm going to put some words in your mouth. Feel free to correct them any way you want. Um, the the Fed can can create bank reserves. It can it can through QE, but they just kind of pile up in in the in the banking system. They don't make their way out into the real economy. And as you said, it's sort of a shell game. It's, it's sort of just a, a paper exchange. Um, to two questions. One is, um, there definitely seems to be a lot of correlation between QE and the price of financial assets. Yep. Is there any relationship there that's material? So even if you ask central bankers, how is QE supposed to work? What is the theory behind this? They won't say money printing because they know, I mean, uh, you or I or no, we can't get our hands on bank reserves. We are not banks. We're not part of the banking system. So it's not like I can go into the grocery store and hand over a bunch of bank reserves and walk out with groceries. So they aren't even money on a technical level, on, an, on a real economy level. They're only for use in the banking channel. So if you actually ask a central banker and if they're actually honest with you 
and say, well, how does this QE stuff supposed to work? They will never say it's money printing because they know it's not. In fact, the, the very first quantitative easing in March of 2001, Bank of Japan, there was one sole dissenter. Her name was Aiko Shinotsuka. She said, why are we doing this quantitative easing? Because we don't know how to do quantity money. We can't define it. What we do is these bank reserves, and therefore we can't tease any, we can't predict any correlation between the level of bank reserves and what happens in the real economy because it's all sort of mushy. It's all psychology. So if you ask a central banker and they're honest with you, well, how is this QE stuff supposed to work? There's three theoretical channels. The first one is uh, interest rate effect. And that's supposedly you know, the supply and demand, the Fed buys bonds or the Bank of Japan buys bonds. And if the Bank of Japan or the Fed is buying government bonds, the, the interest rate's supposed to fall because there's more buyers for those bonds. And what you'll find out there is, no, it doesn't work that way either. Uh, even the most charitable studies find a very negligible impact on, on interest rates because the market is already buying those bonds. And though the central banks come in and buy after the market already has. So the market sets the interest rate and the Fed tries to take credit for it. So the interest rate channel not, doesn't really work. The second channel is uh, portfolio effects. And portfolio effects is, as I said, QE is nothing more than an asset swap. So the central bank comes in and says, I'm going to pay you a little bit extra for that government bond you have in your portfolio. I'm going to give you bank reserves. Now you have fewer earning assets than you had before. We expect that you're going to go out and buy some riskier assets. So by, may take, by, by, by the central bank taking the uh, risky or riskless bond off your hands, you're going to go out in the economy and lend, or you're going to at least buy a corporate bond or some other risky asset, and that's going to help the economy. But what ends up happening, again, uniformly across every jurisdiction where quantitative easing happens, central banks sell their government bonds to, or, or uh, commercial banks sell their government bonds to central banks, and they go out in the market and buy more government bonds. So essentially the shell game where government bonds transit through commercial banking portfolio, dealer portfolios onto the central bank por, uh, balance sheet and nothing ever happens for there. So, the, so there is no portfolio effect, no portfolio rebalancing because of the quantitative easing. The third effect or the third channel, third theoretical channel is simply sentiment. It is the idea that if you believe the central bank is an all powerful institution and it is doing something. You don't really know what it is, but it's doing something. It sounds really complicated. It sounds like they know what they're doing. Then you're going to act as if the central bank is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is accommodative. So if you hear all across CNBC and Bloomberg and the financial media and everybody tells you this quantitative easing stuff is pouring trillions of dollars in the real economy, none of which is true. If you hear that over and over again and you alter your behavior as if that is true, then theoretically it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe the Fed is printing money, then you'll act as if the Fed is printing money by protecting yourself from the money that was never printed. And some of the ways that you do that is you buy real estate, you buy commodities, you buy cryptocurrencies, and you buy stocks. So there is a sentimental effect from quantitative easing. As you said, Adam, there's a very good correlation. It's a loose one, but it's a pretty good correlation but it's not between the actual bank reserves, it's between announcements of quantitative easing. There is a psychological effect, especially in the stock market, but in other asset classes too. And you think about why that is, because every portfolio and fund manager in existence has gone through mainstream education where they're told this Federal Reserve is a central bank, don't fight the Fed. You go work at one of these portfolio or work for one of these funds or whatever, and you, the message is reinforced all, all over the place. And let's, let's also face up to the fact that most portfolio managers get paid when stocks go up. They want to own stocks right. because their clients are happy, fees get bigger, uh, everybody seems to be making a lot of money. And if the Fed provides you with a sentimental excuse for why you're owning stock or why you're buying stocks, even if your clients are calling you and saying, why are we buying stocks? And you can say, well, the Fed's printing money. Jay Powell is supporting market. Don't fight the Fed. There's a sentimental effect. It's not a direct monetary effect because there is none. There is no way for bank reserves to get into the stock market. Yet you see these two correlations because that's the only channel and only in financial markets where quantitative easing has any detectable impact. So the three theoretical channels don't include money printing. And in the real economy, there is no, there's no correlation whatsoever. It's really only the financial economy where you see that effect. And it's really only in sentiment.
Okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is, in many ways, the Fed's most powerful weapon in its arsenal is its job owning, is <laughs> just driving sentiment. <laughs> it's it's actually the media. As long as the and look, it, it's understandable why the media would would behave and, and continue to believe as it does because. I mean, if you're a reporter at a mainstream outlet, you know, these are complicated topics where you believe the experts all know what they're talking about. Right. So you're not going to just, you, well, who are you going to ask for questions about how do you break down these complicated issues? You're going to go run into the central bank. But as, as uh, Ben Bernanke reiterated just a couple of weeks ago from his first blog post after he left the Fed at Brookings in 2015, he said, monetary policy is 98% talk. And it is. It's, it's monetary policy is getting people to believe the Fed is this all-powerful monetary institution. But as I said, if you look through its history, you look at how these things actually work. Again, go back to Paul Volcker, 1979. Everybody's got that all wrong. The Fed is not a money printer. The, the, tr the truth of the matter is the Fed couldn't even define money for you, let alone measure it, let alone manipulate it. That's the real issue here. And that's really kind of what I do with Eurodollar University and the Eurodollar study is put all these things together and realizing the fact that a very, very long time ago, the banking system and the monetary system and even the forms of money that used inside of it have evolved so drastically that left the central bankers and Federal Reserve and everybody, you know, regulators, it left them all in the dust. And so all they have left is this possibility of this, 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 this attempt to manipulate psychology into doing some of the, some of these things that they can't do otherwise as a real central bank would. Wow. You're, um, I don't know if this is apocryphal or true, but uh, the wizard of Oz, apparently Frank Baum wrote it uh, as sort of a, you know, a treatise on monetary history with the, the yellow brick road being gold. And I think the Ruby slippers were originally silver slippers. Silver, yeah. But but the, the basically you're saying the Fed is sort of the great and powerful Oz, which is yep. command you know convincing everybody that that he's omnipotent yet he's just a guy behind the curtain you know who really doesn't have any powers at the end of the day. And that's how you explain how you can get Japan doing 20 years of quantitative easing, which we're told over and over again, the most powerful monetary policy ever conceived. Think about QQE in Japan in 2013, the biggest, most ridiculous, most powerful uh, money printing, whatever, and nothing happened. They're still doing QQE almost a decade later. If it's the most powerful money printing that's ever been conceived by humans, how can it take more than a decade to achieve its goals? It, you're, it, you're, it's the Wizard of Oz. It's, it's the floating head with all the flames and everything else. And the fact that nobody knows the history of money, nobody knows the history of banking. We've all been, we've all been fooled into believing the Fed is this omniscient, omnipotent institution, the ideal technocratic uh, effort. And it goes back into Greenspan, the Great Moderation. A lot of mistakes about that, but essentially, we've, we've. We've allowed ourselves to believe in the myth because for a long time there, it seemed like the myth was at least plausible. But then you run into something like 2007 and 2008, which was a real monetary crisis that the Fed was powerless to do anything about because of course it was. It doesn't do money. All it could do is jawbone against the, you know, this, this, the biggest crisis in the last four generations. So of course, it, it, we ended up with some of the worst, uh, worst uh, conditions, worst consequences from it. It's really that simple. The central banks don't do money. And in lieu of being able to do money, they have to try to manipulate people's behavior as if they were. And the sad thing is you don't have to take my word for it. They admit this freely, not in public, but in some of their uh, private discussions, though occasionally in public, you look think of some of the speeches Alan Greenspan made, in particular in the 1990s. He said, we don't do money. We wouldn't even know where to start. And so we kind of moved the federal funds rate around a little bit and hope that people believe that we're doing what we're doing and that ends up having the results that we want. And through the 1980s, 90s, and the middle 2000s, it kind of looked like that was the case, but it never really was. And so they've kind of led, they've, they've been riding the coattails of the great moderation all this time to essentially beef up this myth about this all-powerful institution. And then when you get to 2007, 2008, it all just falls apart and there's no way to get Humpty Dumpty back together again. All right. Well, well you're, you're blowing, I'm sure, a lot of viewers' minds here, uh, Jeff, and, and you're raising a big question, which maybe we can get into in a little bit, which is, should we even have a, a central bank or a Federal yeah. Reserve if it's, if it's not super effectual here? Um, well, Adam, you know, let, I, usually, I say it all the time and people don't, they don't want to believe it. I said the, the Fed is not a central bank. 
And it's it, the, it in the, any reasonable definition of a central bank, the Fed does not meet any of its criteria. Well, all right. Now I got to ask you to elaborate on that. So why? <laughs> yeah, we have. Well, what is a central bank? A central bank is supposed to be what Walter Badgett said back in the 19th century, which is lend freely high rates uh, on good collateral. That's not what the Fed does. The Fed does psychological manipulation where it buys bonds, hopefully trying to rescue markets whenever they become illiquid, rather than supplying currency, which is the idea. A central bank is supposed to be a public utility that solves the inelasticity problem. And the inelasticity problem is something that plagued the banking system, the monetary system throughout the, the 18th and 19th centuries into the 20th century. Uh, you think about the Great Depression, for example, that was an inelasticity problem that the Fed was supposed to be, be there, didn't work very well then either. So the Fed isn't actually a central bank. It doesn't actually create elastic currency because in the modern sense, it wouldn't even know how to. It can print physical currency, I think that's part of the problem here is most people don't understand what money actually is either. When you ask somebody what is money, they think it's you know these pieces of paper you have in your pocket. But the truth of the matter is, in any major industrial economy, hand-to-hand -hand currency has been hasn't been a, an important part of the economy in over a century. Everything is bank money. Everything is ledger money, and so it, it prioritizes and it. it, it uh, Banks are primary, the banks are central rather than central banks. And if the central banks don't really understand and know what the commercial banks are doing in terms of money, I'm thinking about things like repo, currency swaps, derivative transactions that span not just, that go inside and outside the United States, that go beyond the, the American boundaries. Banking system, the banking system worldwide, this euro dollar system is so unbelievably incredibly complex that a, that the Federal Reserve or any of the other central banks around the world, they simply cannot perform the role of a central bank. They cannot create elastic currency because they don't even know how to define the currency that's being used. All right, and let's define the word euro dollar for a moment. Um, it's a big area of your expertise. Uh, not every viewer, I don't think, knows what you mean when you say that. And, and in your answer, if you can just confirm that the euro dollar market is that you said it's really complex, but it's vastly larger than the currency supply domestically here in the States. So in many ways, and correct me if you think I'm wrong here, the, the euro dollar is, is, is the dog and, and the, the Fed is just the tail. Yeah, I even, the Fed is something else on the other side of the room. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's no, but you're, you're exactly uh, the euro dollar is a system. It's a monetary system that arose in the 1950s. And to be perfectly honest with you, nobody knows where it came from. It just kind of showed up uh, during the middle 1950s, late 1950s. Uh, one of the first observers, a guy by the name of Paul Einzig said, I stumbled across it by accident in the late 50s. And all the bankers who were trading in these US dollars outside the United States told him they begged him not to write about it because they were making so much money in this offshore market. So essentially, euro dollar means offshore dollars. That's what euro means. It's not about the European common currency. It means offshore. So if you see the term euro yen, that just means offshore yen. That's the amount of, of Japanese currency that's traded outside of Japan. Right. You, you should think of it market. as almost non-US US dollars, right? Exactly. Except there are no US dollars either. That's the other trick. So it's offshore, it's outside. And when I say offshore, it's offshore everywhere. And I don't mean that physically, but I mean in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of regulation. So if you're a bank in the Cayman Islands, you go to the Cayman Islands where my podcast co-host Emil Kalinowski lives, there's trillions upon trillions of dollars there, but the, and there's all sorts of massive banks there, but you'll see there aren't any banks or dollars on the island. It's all simply fictional. It's all virtual. It's all ledger money. So there aren't physical currency. It's not like there's pallets of actual Federal Reserve notes being traded. There's no gold, obviously. It is all basically ledger money, and it's a distributed ledger that is kept by the global banking system. Essentially, IOUs, if you want to put it that way. Um, banks that trade IOUs all over the world, instantaneous settlement, um, elegant solution to Triffin's paradox in the 1950s. And then because it was offshore, because it was banks being able to freely experiment with all these monetary forms, it has simply evolved over decades when nobody was monitoring, watching it, let alone regulating it, uh, to the, what we see today, which is an unbelievably complicated. And as you said, Adam, it's not like this is a niche market. This is not like a little thing. And in many ways and in many respects, it's wrong to think about it as if there are two separate dollar systems. 
as if there's this euro dollar system and then there's a domestic domestic dollar system. It's really all euro dollar. And the euro dollar system is so unbelievably huge, we have absolutely no idea how big it is. Uh, some of the last, uh, last known that I know of, the last um, estimates for how big the euro dollar system had become go back to 1988. And then they stopped there. A company by the name of Morgan Guarantee used to try to keep track of what they called the euro currency market, which wasn't even the whole thing. It was just the amount of, of, of offshore money that they could keep track of. And they stopped in, in, I think it was March of 1988, because they said, we can't keep track of it. But even so, in March of 1988, they estimated that the euro dollar currency that they could identify was about 50% more than the entire domestic money supply at that time. So even in 1988, more euro dollars that were just visible than the entire domestic money supply that anybody, and I'm talking about M1, M2, M3, uh, everything that could have been ident identified in the monetary aggregates in the 1980s, there was still more of it outside the US. And then, of course, you have to believe in the 90s and 2000s, it just went exponential, parabolic right. growth. That's how we ended up with something like the housing bubble in the US, corporate credit bubble around the rest of the world. Essentially, the euro dollar system was responsible for all of that. All right. So a couple more quick dots to connect here, which is, um, and please correct me if any of this is wrong. Um, so as I understand it, there's, there's really sort of two ways in which currency can come into existence. Um, the, the Fed can create it, um, but also the banking system loans it into existence. And we have a fractional, res fractional reserve banking system, which means that you know I can take in a uh, hundred dollars as a bank and I can, I can loan 90% of that out. Uh, and then uh, those dollars as they get redeposited and banks can then be loaned out again. So there's sort of a multiplicative effect here. Is it true that, that Euro dollars pretty much the same way, meaning a Euro dollar gets brought into existence because somebody makes a loan denominated in dollars outside of the U S and then the repayments on that, the interest that's charged, that all that is is basically money that's being created, dollars that are being created out of thin air. Is that correct? Yes, this is all bank assets and liabilities. So there isn't, it isn't even if there's cash in a vault like in a traditional uh, fractional reserve system. In a traditional fractional reserve system, you can't multiply something you don't have in the vault, right? You have to have right. at least some cash in order to make multiple claims on. It. That's where the euro dollar system really gets complicated and weird because there aren't even there isn't even physical cash there. So it's governed not by the amount of cash in the system because there really isn't any. It's governed by the bank covenants and some of the uh, uh, you know internal constraints on bank balance sheets, because essentially, as you said, there is a multiplier effect. But what we're multiplying isn't cash; it's claims on cash. It isn't um, physical Federal Reserve notes. It's it's claims on another bank's ability to get them if ever they were uh, required to but nobody ever wants to convert to cash because you think about who operates in the euro dollar system. It's either other banks, other financial institutions, non-bank financial institutions, or corporate customers. And none of those, none of those, uh, none of those participants want physical cash. It's not like you or I would, would want uh, to hold physical cash in our pocket because we choose to have that form of liquidity. Everybody is okay with operating on a cashless basis because they understand the rules of the game. They understand how everything works. Whereas you or I, this is all just, you know, this is all opaque. It's all, it's all uh, very hard to understand. And so we're kind of starting at a, an, an information disadvantage as well as a positional disadvantage because we don't really, we're not really allowed to participate in it. But it, uh, it is essentially like a fractional reserve multiplication effort, except for the fact it's not, we're not multiplying actual cash. We're actually multiplying claims on cash. Okay. All right. So I'm going to try to tie all this together here. So we've, we've got the Fed and its limitations you discussed earlier. We've got this massive euro dollar market that opaque, hard to understand, but it's definitely a big influencer in what's going on in, in the monetary world. Um, I'm trying to get here to the inflation, which is the, the increase yeah. in, in costs that we've been seeing. And then I'm going to tie that to, to recession. Um, so last question before we really dig into that, which is... Um, you, you, you talked about the Fed not really be, it, being able to get sort of new money supply out into the real world. Um, I want to make the distinction between monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus, because um, what, what changed sort of in, in the past two years is we saw a lot of fiscal stimulus join the monetary stimulus in parallel. And 
uh, I guess two questions around this one fiscal stimulus a lot of people say well that's a lot more inflationary because that goes directly into the economy those are checks that are going to households you know etc right so you're increasing sort of the velocity of money um, uh, a is that true and B can you say that the Fed sort of indirectly enables uh, fiscal stimulus because it's it's buying treasuries from the U.S. Treasury that Congress is then using to push out? Well, yeah, the, the old, taking the second part first, monetization of the debt. I mean, that's a, that's a charge the Fed has been, uh, in the Bank of Japan, has been dealing with since the first quantitative easing. And you go back to 2009, everybody was accusing the Fed of monetizing the debt back then, too. And I don't think people realize how much of the debt the Federal Reserve has owned basically throughout. I mean, you go back to something like 2003, 2004, people might be uh, surprised to learn that the Fed owned 10% of the national debt before quantitative easing. They have always earned, or they've always owned what they call earning assets because the Fed by, by mandate is supposed to fund its own activities. And the only way it can do that is by exchanging these bank reserves for actual assets in its portfolio. So the Fed has owned a lot of treasuries and MBS and other things for a long period, for quite a long time. It only became an issue when we got to quantitative easing and the proportion changed a little bit. I think it went from 10% to about 15, 16, 17% by around 2014 or so. But you're right, something was different in 2020 and 2021 when the Federal Reserve, not to, you know, the Federal Reserve did quantitative, but the federal government started to do, get involved directly in the economy through its helicopter drops giving people directly cash that it was borrowing from the treasury market that some people say was monetized by the Fed. And that's an argument that, that people can, be, can make. But I think by and large, what really happened was that the federal government borrowed from the treasury market, which was only too willing to buy safe and liquid assets. And so it didn't need the Fed to monetize that debt. The treasury market was going to buy whatever the, the federal government was going to sell. Um, and so what you have isn't, a, isn't necessarily the creation of money or the monetization from the Fed as much as it is a redistribution on corporate commercial balance sheets, uh, commercial bank balance sheets. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily money creation, but you're right, it, it was a way to circumvent in one sense the lack of willingness of the banking system to lend into the real economy. So it was a redistribution borrowed from the treasury market that the federal government then injected into the real economy which had a temporary impact. It absolutely had a major impact on the global economy, but it was temporary. It wasn't a permanent shift in economic activity. It was a temporary rightward shift in the demand curve, which again, as I said before, given the inelasticities in supply, including the transportation of goods worldwide, the ability to get stuff off of boats in Los Angeles and Long Beach, for example, made supply incredibly inelastic. So you have this rightward, the temporary rightward shift in the demand curve, inelastic supply, prices explode. It's not because of money printing. No money was printing. No money was ever actually printed. It was essentially a supply shock. And when I say no money is printed, you don't have to take my word for it. You, there are statistics for it. For example, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, um, the Federal Reserve, um, uh, controls, <laughs> what am I trying to say here? The Fed uh, keeps track of something called the financial accounts of the United States or the Z1 report. And in the Z1 data, it's some of the most comprehensive financial statistics you'll find anywhere in basically human history. Uh, and what you'll see is that there is a slight bump in the amount of treasuries that were issued, the, the liabilities of federal government in 2020 and 2021, but absolutely no change in the private uh, credit markets. And that includes some of the credit market from the rest of the world, from the Euro dollar system, the amount of credit that comes from outside the US into the US. There was no change and there has been no change going back to 2007 and 2008. So as far as systemic change in terms of money printing, that never happened in 2020 and 2021. The only thing that did change is, that, is the supply shock. So QE, even federal government spending to, to an extent, at least categorically, those were the same things that we've seen since the ARRA back in 2009, or any of the number of fiscal interventions the Japanese did throughout the 1990s that were not inflationary either. In fact, the more the federal government does, the worse it seems to become and more deflationary, disinflation over the long run, because of course it would. 
The federal government is horrible at economics. The federal government is only going to make an economy more inefficient. It's gonna be more of a drag on the economy than it ever was before. So the more the federal government does, and the Japanese are a perfect example, over the long run, we're going to, we would expect that to be disinflationary, deflationary, and a drag on economic growth, which is kind of what we're starting to see now. So the one thing that changed, the one thing that really changed in 2020 and 2021, it was not money printing. It was not really the federal government. It was basically the supply and elasticities and the temporary, the degree of the temporary shift in demand. And that's where the prices came from. And if that was actually the case, then we would expect history shows supply shocks typically end in a recession that rebalances everything, reverts everything back to the disinflationary, deflationary mean, which is kind of what we're seeing right now. All right. Excellent. This is exactly where I wanted to get. And, and, and if I can, I'm going to quickly just sort of recap what you said, and I'm going to murder. This isn't a good analogy, but it's the best my brain is thinking of here off the cuff. Um, you're saying that uh, let's assume we have a a, 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 a hose in which uh, the currency usually flows in the status quo. Um, we saw a substantial influx of new volume into that hose, which I think many, maybe many people thought, oh, well, that's because of all the stimulus that the Fed printed up and that went in there. And you're saying, nope, didn't come from the Fed, came from the treasury market. So instead of, instead of, uh, turning on a spigot and getting new water, you know, coming from the water pipe. Instead, we found a, I don't know, a big bucket lying around of water that had already been put out and was in the world. And we just started siphoning from that into the yes. hose. So yeah. we, we have this kind of pig through the python moment where we're just getting this big bolus of new water trying to go through this hose. But then we had supply constraints. So think of those as kinks in the hose, right? That That's making water travel through the hose harder, right? And so we're forcing a lot more water through a less efficient hose. That then obviously is the supply shocks you're talking about that, that drove prices a lot higher. And what I hear you saying is, is that's all temporary. Eventually the water makes its way through the hose. You know, the, the gardener comes out and fixes the kinks. The hose gets more efficient again. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're not putting a bunch more stimulus back into the front of that hose again, the flow is actually going to start abating. And so you're going to have that, that disinflationary, deflationary, slower growth scenario where things kind of, you know, re-equilibrate and, and water finds its true level. I probably murdered a number of analogies there, but is that roughly what's happened? Yeah. And I would even go, I mean, that's, I think it's a pretty good analogy because as the pressure builds up in those, that kinked hose, what comes out of the nozzle, it comes out really fast because of the pressure that builds up. Right. And so everybody assumes that, you know, this, this massive pressure, even though it's less flow, is the real economy being overheated. It's, it's prices going up. And we think that the economy's done, oh, the Fed's done too much or the, the federal government's too much when it really is kind of an illusion. And so we get caught up in consumer prices and conflate consumer prices for the real economic con condition or the real monetary condition. And we think that they, man, these, they, they've done way too much. And we got to cut back on this, this stuff because otherwise it'll be the 1970s all over again. You heard that all of last year, that this is great inflation 2.0. When in fact, if you go back and look at the hose and see all the kinks in it and see the big, the bucket that was, a, you know, as you said, the, the, the supply reservoir on the side, and you realize, oh, this is temporary. And that's really, I mean, the old saying is the cure for high prices is high prices. Right. In a non-monetary inflationary environment where there isn't excessive currency being printed by the banking system, then it was only ever going to be temporary because it had to be. You think about if we're paying more for gasoline, absent that money printing, absent the credit creation that needs to be needs to have for it to become sustainable inflation, the more you pay for gasoline, the less you have available to pay for other things. So that's great for oil producers, not so good for other people, other parts of the economy. And over the last couple of years, as we've all been paying attention to the goods economy, because that's where all the activity is, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? We don't, I don't think people appreciate how bad the services economy has been. Um, the services part, you look at the uh, PCE numbers, the, 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 the um, GDP report, for example, for services spending, they still haven't gotten back to where we were in 2020. Two years later, there's less spending in real terms on services than there had been when we started this thing. So we went nuts. Americans went nuts spending on goods, but that was not the entire economic story. In fact, 
because we were spending on goods and a lot of it was not voluntarily spending on goods, you know, paying more at the pump, paying more at the grocery store, things like that, there was less to be spent in other places. And the, the longer that goes on and the more it goes on, the more it harms these other places. And eventually it becomes too much where you have this snapback effect right. where we've, we've, we've essentially robbed the economy of its vitality by forcing price changes in all the most inefficient ways. I mean, paying a lot for gasoline is one of the most inefficient ways to run any modern economy. And eventually you're going to have to pay for that with all the other ways that we have to absorb those costs, which includes lesser activity and some of the more sustainable, economically viable parts of the economy. So eventually, if left to its own devices, as it has been over the last couple of years, um, it has to, you ha you're going to end up with a snapback effect. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. All right. And, and yeah, and, and, you know, the role of prices is to create a signal that then drives, you know, economic behavior. And when your prices get distorted, you get distorted behaviors, which eventually have to correct, which is exactly what you're saying here. Yeah. And because, um, sorry, yeah. and because the supply side has been so incredibly inelastic, which means inefficient, it hasn't been able to respond to those signals by increasing supply and then getting everything back in some more of an organic, natural balance. And, you know, gasoline oil production is a perfect example. You got oil into the three, you know, over $100 a barrel and supply has kind of trickled back online. That is not, the, the, you know, again, that, that's, that's going to lead to all sorts of problems because prices are supposed to signal these things and they have been, but the supply side in particular hasn't been able to respond to them. Yeah. Um... And it's sort of been a little bit of this year's sort of been a year sort of like, you know, the hits just keep on coming right on the supply side where, you know, we had the initial COVID lockdowns, then we were getting out of them, um, but then you had multiple waves and then you had, you know, chip shortages that impacted everything else. And then you had the, the, the embargoes against Russia after the Ukrainian invasion. So it's kind of been the sort of like, it's just been really hard to kind of get the system back to a place where it can sort of self-heal because there, these hand grenades keep getting tossed in there. But eventually, in theory, that that things should equilibrate at some point in time and we, sh we should have a moderation here and hopefully we get that sooner rather than later. Um, all right, so, uh, so we're now at the point here where, um, who knows, maybe, maybe Jerome Powell was right. Maybe this is all transitory. Transitory is just taken longer than they all thought, right? But eventually that, that the water from that, that reservoir that we're putting into our hose, eventually we use all that up. Eventually the supply kinks come on out and you say, hey, we're already beginning to see that, right? I mean, economic growth is slowing. We're seeing that uh, GDP looks like it was negative both quarters of this year here in the US. Um, we're seeing you know, all sorts of signs of demand destruction. Um, uh, and so it looks like we are heading into uh, a slowing effect here. So now we'll get to the sort of the, the probability here uh, of recession. Um, at, at this point in time, what do you sort of peg the odds of recession at? Um, uh, like I said in the intro, some people think it's almost you know, baked in the cake at this point. Are you that confident? Yeah, and I think I go back to what the markets are saying. And I'm, by markets, I mean, you know, fixed income, treasury market, euro dollar futures, interest rate swaps, some of the more deeper fundamental stuff that, uh, you know, the monetary system itself telling us what's going on. And you look at the yield curve inversion since March, that's not a good sign. Euro dollar futures have been verted since December, and they've only gotten more and more twisted and distorted to, to lately. The euro dollar futures curve in particular is just unbelievably incredibly ugly um which is saying that if we take the if we interpret the euro dollar future signal what it's saying is that there is a very very high probability the fed rate hikes end before the end of this year so what would it take to stop the fed before the end of 2022 to get it out of its hawkish, utterly ultra hawkish inflation fighting mode to say we're done hiking rates. And maybe if again, uh, if the euro dollar futures curve is right, and it has been right historically to start cutting rates. So how do we get Jay Powell from want to be Paul Volcker 1994, 75 basis points at a time to stopping rate hikes and maybe starting to cut them all over the next six months? What does the economy and financial markets look like under that kind of a scenario? And I think the answer is the market is discounting heavily 
the fact that it's not just a recession, but it might be a kind of a nasty one. And that's how that's how we get the Fed out of its inflation fighting and into rate cutting like it wants to be. And that's how we account for all the way the markets are pricing these probabilities, uh, not just now, but through time, where as events have happened, as everything has unfolded, they've become more and more and more convinced that this is the scenario that's going to play out, not less and less convinced or you know, any opportunity along the way for a deviation, for the economy to move in another direction, for the monetary system to, to actually uh, contain itself. Um, through time, it's only been the markets are more and more convinced. Nothing is ever 100%. Nothing is ever inevitable. But the way these curves are priced now, I, I baked into it. Yeah, I think the, it, our, our baseline best case here is a shallow recession. And I think uh, the markets are starting to contemplate something more serious than even that. Okay. Uh, and I want to dig into that. But real quick, would you, from your point of view, say that the Fed is making a policy mistake here in terms of continuing to tighten into a problem that is solving itself? Yeah, well, I think that the Fed. Our interview with Jeff will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. Last, if the challenging macro outlook Jeff has detailed in this interview has you feeling a little nervous about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks Jeff has mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our interview with Jeff Snyder.